Genesis chapter 32, verses 21 through, and 22 through 31. Um, Jacob wrestles with God. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the port of the trap of the chapel. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip, his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven, for you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he, but he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he had passed Peniel, limping because of his head. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good morning. Anybody uh, struggling with a hair frizz today because of the humidity? Yeah. Guess who's not? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Tom as well. <laughs> You know, um, when I think back over my life, the most meaningful things in it are the things I've had to work really hard for. We often take the constants in life for granted. We don't think about them all that much. We have air to breathe and water to drink and bathe in and electricity to light and heat things. We have food. We have shelter. These are a given for most of us. We're all born into a world and into a context where everything is done for us by somebody. Someone shelters us, someone cooks for us, someone cleaned up after us, someone bandaged us when we got hurt. And the older that I get, the more I come to appreciate my mentors and my teachers, but when I was under their care at the time, I despised them. Then I grew up and I got out into the world and I realized, man, this is not so easy. This is what it was like for them. That's why they told me that story and showed me how to do such and such. This is hard. Today I want to talk about a word that pops up over and over again in the scriptures related to this idea of us having to struggle for the things that we cherish. The word appears thousands of times in the Bible, and yet because we are English-speaking people, many of us have no idea what the word really means, or we think of it simply as a geographic location somewhere on the globe. But that word is the word Israel. The meaning of this word is explained in that passage that we heard just a second ago, where Jacob wrestles with a man during the night for many hours, and he comes to find out by the end of the night that the man he's wrestling with is, in fact, God. And God says to Jacob at the end of the passage, he asks, what is your name? And Jacob replies, Jacob. And then the man said, your name's no longer going to be Jacob. Your name will be Israel because you have struggled with God and have overcome. And if you look up that word, Israel, in a Bible dictionary, in a lexicon, you'll see that it means just that. Israel means to struggle with God. You will be called Israel because you have struggled with God and have overcome. It's an interesting story and an interesting word because it pushes up against much of what we've been taught to believe about God. And just to make sure we learn the lesson, the word appears 2,319 times in the Bible. If anything, this story and this word reveal to us that we have a lot of misconceptions about God and God's dealing with human beings. 
And the greatest of all misconceptions that we hold to about God is the misconception that God can only be known in seasons of peace and seasons of ease and seasons of bliss rather than in seasons of struggle and suffering. This story, as much as a part of Scripture as any other part of the Bible that we hold on to, leaves us scratching our heads because it violates this misconception. If you're taking notes this morning, write this down because this is what I want us to remember for the week. We discover the most important lessons in our life, in our struggles, not in our successes. We discover the most important lessons in our life, in our struggles, not in our successes. And like Jacob, we have the limps to prove it. Long nights, dark days, challenges, trials, limits, loss. In hindsight, we can look at many of those things as good things. They drew things out of us that we didn't know we were capable of. They strengthened us. They toughened our resolve. They grew us as people. We learned invaluable lessons in the struggle. But those lessons came at a high cost. What would it do to our life and our faith if we thought of our relationship to and with God according to the truth in this word and in this passage? What if God is something harder to understand than a synaptic post on social media that only fits into 180 characters? Is it 180 or 140? 240. It's 240 now. Oh my gosh, we've been liberated. It's almost been done. <laughs> now we can actually tweet about God and put it all in. Okay. <laughs> God is inviting us in this word to struggle with him. And struggle is very real. It is normal. It is appropriate. It is good. And actually, if you're living in your life and in your faith without any struggle, you're not really living at all. My uh, mother was raised in a single parent home. Her father passed away when she was very young. And my mom's mother, my grandmother, raised my mom, her sister, and her two brothers all by herself. This was a long time ago, long before people bought hefty life insurance policies or they were able to apply for financial aid from the government. My grandmother worked long days in a sweatshop to provide for her children. A giant warehouse filled with rows and rows of people sitting at sewing machines and sewing garments. And she was one of them. And my mom told me a story once that I will never forget and it always surfaces in my mind when I think about this topic of struggle. One day she was walking with her mother uh, in the town where my mom grew up and my mom saw a pair of shoes in a store window. And my grandmother noticed that my mom was really into these shoes. But this was not a shoe store like Payless or Walmart where you could get things at a really affordable price. It was an expensive store that the wealthy people shopped in. And so knowing they were unable to afford the shoes, they just kept on walking. And a few weeks later, my grandmother brought a box home from, for my mom and she handed it to her, and my mom tore open the wrapping paper, and she looked inside, and there were those shoes from the store window. My mom was overjoyed. She'd never gotten anything so nice in her life. And the following day, on the way to school, my mom was proudly wearing her new expensive shoes, but she was limping while she was walking on the way. And my grandmother looked down at her and she asked her, Honey, why are you walking like that? Are the new shoes I got you hurting your feet? Are they not comfortable? And she said, No, Mama. The shoes are very comfortable. I like them. In fact, I like them so much 
because I know how hard you worked for them. And I didn't want to bend my toes and put creases in the leather. My mom understood, even as a child, the real cost of those shoes. And it wasn't on a price tag. It was the cost of a single mom of four picking up extra hours at a sewing factory to show her daughter how much she was loved. It was a gift that was earned by hardness, by hard work and by struggle, and that made this gift, this pair of shoes, worth far more than any other pair of shoes in the world. Jesus in the New Testament was asked by one of the religious giants of his day what the greatest commandment in all of Scripture was. It recounts it this way in Mark's Gospel. It said, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. How many times have we read that passage? Many of us can quote it by heart, or at least some truncated version of it. And yet we as English speakers here in the West who just think of Israel as a place, we gloss over the very beginning of the greatest commandment in Scripture. It begins with, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O you who struggle with God. All of you who wrestle with God, listen. This is what matters the most in life. Loving God and loving other people is a struggle. And that's how it's supposed to be. It takes heart. It takes energy. It takes soul. It takes strength. And yet Jesus says this is the greatest commandment. Struggle with God. Love God. Love people. We discover the most important lessons in life in our struggles, not in our successes. How are you doing in your life today? And don't answer out loud. Tell somebody else later. But, <laughs> but how are you in your life today? What are you wrestling with? Where are you struggling? Where are you limping? Are you ignoring the difficulties as some sort of curse? Or are you courageously embracing? Are you fighting a good fight? Maybe you aren't being cursed. Maybe what you're actually experiencing is premature enlightenment. Maybe you haven't been forsaken. Maybe you're being authentically loved. Maybe you're learning something in your season of struggle that will radically alter the way that you see yourself and others for the rest of your life. But if you keep ignoring it and you keep numbing it and you keep thinking of it as something that's bad, you'll never see it. You'll never get the lesson. Maybe you are being fashioned into the very best version of yourself. Maybe God is right there in the midst of your struggle and you think you're struggling with a thing but you're actually struggling with God itself. It's okay to be angry 
It's okay to be anxious and nervous. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. It's okay to walk away from a hard season with a limp. It's okay to go through something so difficult that it changes the name that God and everyone else calls you by. Because there's something that we learn there. There's something that we need to know in order to become who we are meant to be. No, God doesn't cause the suffering. No, God doesn't cause the calamity and God doesn't cause the pain. But the universe wastes nothing. Not even the hard times. And God can even use our seasons of loss and struggle for something good. And in this, we can take comfort and find rest for our souls. Is everybody still with me? Who can give me five more minutes? Raise your hand if you can give me five more minutes. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. <laughs> That's an old preacher joke. My dad taught me that one. I, um, a few years ago, I guess it would have been uh, almost ten years ago now, I was working at a church uh, outside the city of Pittsburgh being trained as a young minister to move into the city and start a church. And this church that I worked at was a wonderful place, very open-minded, very curious people. And we were doing this sermon series called What's the Difference, which was really just a, a series about comparative religion. We were looking at the major religions in the world and just trying to learn what we could from them as people who were often too locked into a Christian worldview. And we had an experience and met a figure that would alter the things that I would study for the rest of my life. Uh, we visited a Buddhist monastery and met a Zen monk there. Now, now what's funny is you would think this would be a really peaceful place, right? The monk's dog actually attacked my friend, which was just like jarring. How does she not have some sort of magical power over animals? Like, how did this happen? But anyway, that's not the point. But we met this monk, and she was telling us about just the, the basic truths of Buddhism. And as a Christian, I didn't know any of this stuff, and I was alarmed to find out how similar the two streams of thought were. And I went home that day and was thinking about everything she had told me. And, you know, 10 years ago, we still bought books on paper. And the next day, I went to Barnes and Nobles, and I just bought every Buddhist text I could find, and I started reading through them. And one of the things, at least here in the West, I don't, I don't know about Eastern Buddhism, but Western Buddhism, whether it's Pure Land Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism, one of the things that um, is, is just at this foundational level of Buddhist belief is something called dukkha. Everybody say dukkha. Dukkha. It's kind of funny, right? But what dukkha translates to in English is either the words dissatisfaction or suffering. It's this idea that we want things in life that we're never getting. We might get them to the degree of 90% or even 95%, but there's always something that's just gnawing and nagging in us that we're not getting, we're dissatisfied. And this is the root cause of suffering in human life, according to Buddhism. That's what Buddhism is trying to fix. And I started reading through the Dhammapada and uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and all these books trying to understand this concept more and more. And I began to realize as I would go around throughout my day that uh, as a Christian, you know, we're taught that everything it just kind of centers around and hinges around love, which is wonderful. That's true. But as I would explore what was going on in my life and in myself with my problems and with my struggles, this idea of dukkha really began to um, form in me. 
And as I would sit and I would get quiet for prayer in the morning, I would realize that many of the things I was praying for were not altruistic in the least. They were things that I was dissatisfied about, that I was asking God to fix. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from other traditions as followers of Jesus that are all right in there in Scripture, but we often don't see them because of the way the Western mind perceives uh, this sort of Western Christian set of ideals. There's more to life than just loving and being loved. In fact, Jesus said it right there in this passage. There's something that precedes that. You struggle. Here, those of you who struggle, love God, love people. And if all we gravitate towards in our lives are the things that we love, without struggle in front of them, we're getting this very mixed up. We're not reading the passage in its entirety. We're not thinking about the, what the words really mean. So as you go out this week into your life, when you find yourself butting up against dukkha or suffering or dissatisfaction. Pause for a second before you resist it, before you push it away, before you blot it out of your mind, and ask yourself, what is this trying to teach me? What's in this that I'm not getting because that's why it's coming up in me or around me or why I'm recognizing it in so many of the people in my life? Maybe this is a lesson and not a curse. That was more than five minutes. Let's stand and pray. But you gave me 35, so. God is I stand in this place today in this beautiful building, this beautiful structure. In my mind, I can think of the 10,000 things that need fixed and painted and cleaned and retooled. God, as I drive in my car, I see the engine light that's on and I think of the tires that need replacing and the windshield that is cracked. When I look in the mirror, I see someone that I'm not always proud of. Someone that maybe needs to be more in shape, that can envision a life without having to take medicine. In every arena of my life, as good as it is at times, underneath all of it, there is disappointment. There is dissatisfaction. There is suffering. Forgive me for the times where I overlook that or I just try to focus on something else so that I can ignore those things in my life that you're trying to use to teach me something. Forgive me for the times where I look at your blessings as curses. Forgive me for the times where I just always want what's easy for free. Make us into people that are hardened but tender in our lives, Lord. People who are after the mountain, who can take the hill, but at the same time we are soft enough to remember those that are still at the bottom of the hill trying to get up it.
We give our hearts to you this morning in their entirety. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.